When we talk about productivity growth, what we mean by that is output per hour of work. And the way I like to think about it is, um, I may have mentioned it earlier in the semester, there are at least two ways we could build a 10 foot deep trench, 30 feet long. One is to take a whole mess of people and give them picks and shovels and have them dig it, in which case their productivity per hour will be fairly low. The other is to invest in a large piece of capital equipment called a backhoe and one worker and build that same trench in about 40 minutes. It is that investment in new technology, plus perhaps in the skills of the operator of the backhoe, so he doesn't destroy anything, that leads to this tremendous improvement in productivity. Now, why is that good for society? Well, because if you're operating at near full employment, you could take all of those workers who before were using their picks and shovels to make trenches, and you can reallocate them to make other things. Again, this assumes that we're operating in a full employment economy. So that what you really want to do for economic growth, weird as it may seem in an era when we're facing eight or perhaps higher, eight percent or higher unemployment rates, is economic growth actually occurs when you free up labor to work in other fields. <coughs> the more productive we are so that we can get the output we need, we can then grow our economy, become more prosperous, be able to provide <coughs> more goods and services. And I don't want to go into discussion about what those are. They can be good goods and services or ones that you personally consider to be not so good. But by freeing up labor, we grow. And that is basically the theory of economic growth. That through capital investment and technological innovation, we free up labor that is stuck doing low productivity operations in order to be involved in doing higher productivity operations. Right? And when we talk about technological progress, what we mean is advances in knowledge. The ability to find better, newer and better processes to produce the products and services we want. That's what we mean. To find better, newer and better processes, advances in knowledge that allow us to do that. Nonetheless, in the standard neoclassical theory as it was first developed in the 1950s, technology was a black box. And in fact, quite interesting, as a graduate student learning this stuff in the mid-60s, the way we dealt with technology was simply to put in the letter T into our equations and make an assumption that technology was growing at something like 2% a year. We had no idea in the early growth models, quite naive growth models, as to what contributed to technological growth. We just knew it was important, but we didn't have a model of it. We didn't know how it got created. It obviously came out of people's minds, but how did you can create, how did you convert technological advance into real output? And what the new growth theorists did was to do that. This standard neoclassical theory, particularly as developed uh, by not only Solo, but a colleague of his, Dale Jorgensen, uh, really focused on the growth in capital input, tangible assets like factories and machines, as the most important source of economic growth, with labor input being the second most important. So if you really, in those early models, wanted to ask the question, why did we grow so quickly in the United States, let's say during the 20th century, it was that we were investing huge amounts into building bigger and bigger plants, bigger and bigger equipment. Uh, where I grew up in Detroit, during World War II, you had one big industrial complex called the Rouge Plant, which had been built by Henry Ford. And during World War II, when it was producing all kinds of war material, you had 100,000 workers employed in one industrial complex, that kind of size. And it, it gets celebrated uh, in great art like that of Diego Rivera, the great Mexican muralist uh, whose uh, painting, uh, frescoes, uh, adorn the main room of the Detroit Museum of Art. And you could just see it, just this huge amount of equipment as it was celebrated. And then, of course, the increase in labor input and uh, technological progress 
was in the model. But what we really focused on in those original models is how do we boost the savings rate in order to have investment in more physical capital, as well as a little bit in labor. These models actually, when you work them out mathematically, gave you a law of diminishing returns, which was to say, after you've increased the amount of investment to a certain point, additional units of physical capital actually give you a smaller and smaller return on each additional unit. And that law of diminishing returns and the calculus that goes along with it, uh, with its first and second order conditions mathematically, uh, would explain why growth doesn't continue to just expand and expand and expand, even as you get more and more capital investment, because each unit of capital investment after some point <coughs> gives you less and less in a sense, um, it's a rather pessimistic model suggesting that there are fairly strict limits to growth uh, which are defined by how much physical capital investment you have and the rate at which you have diminishing marginal returns. The new growth theory, which develops in the late 70s and then during the 80s with people like Paul Romer at Stanford, and, uh, Dick Nelson at Columbia, and Sid Winter, who was actually a fact taught me at Michigan, was kind of reversed that model. It said, yeah, obviously capital investment is important in real physical things. <coughs> yeah, labor is real important. But what really is at the center of economic progress, uh, economic growth, is technological progress. And that, to the uninitiated, sounds like how many angels on the head of a pin, but indeed, that movement away from how much you invest in physical capital per se to how rapidly you can have technological progress, how much we can use knowledge to enhance economic growth is a fundamental shift in the way we thought or we think about growth. For one thing, as you might imagine, it begins to tell us that those factors, those phenomena, phenomena that enhance technological progress are more important than ever. I love it because I'm a professor at a university and we supposedly are part of the process that generates knowledge. Allegedly. <laughs> the other thing though that's very exciting about it is that because of the nature of technological progress and the ability for a new technology <coughs> once it's invented to be infused into many, many different industries is that you can actually avoid diminishing returns. You can actually get increasing returns so that you can have a given amount of physical capital, a given amount of human capital, but through new technological progress that you may borrow from somewhere else, get incredible increases in output without any increase or very little increase in physical capital or even human capital. In fact, in the extreme, way in the extreme, never to be seen, at least on this, in this galaxy, you could get infinite productivity growth. Lots more output without any more inputs at all, except for technology. And that might be just borrowed. New growth theory has four major premises. In the old growth theory, technology was this black box. It just occurred, right? We just use the letter T, actually, <coughs> for time. It just marches through time at 2% a year. Now the new growth theorists were trying to ask the question, what is responsible for technological change? And what does it do? Well, one of the neat things it does, according to Romer and his colleagues, is that when you have technological <coughs> change, it actually provides an incentive for new capital investment. And the reason for that is, while it may be possible to invest new technology in old capital equipment, quite often the only way you can have a new technology is to create entirely new capital equipment. Right? You can't put old technology into, I mean new technology into an old type steel mill and expect to get more steel, you actually have to build 
electric furnaces, which are very different than Bessemer converters. So technological change helps enhance growth because it actually provides a strong incentive for more capital investment. Second, technological change is subject to various complementarities and feedback loops. You get technological progress of one kind, which induces technological progress in an, of another kind, which may in fact enhance the original technological progress. And that can lead to all kinds of virtuous cycles where technological gains lead to even greater technological gains. One of the great examples that most of us have lived through, now we've all lived through in this room, has been all the technological progress that has been made in terms of information technologies. From the very simple transistors first developed at the Bell Labs and produced by companies like Texas Instru Instruments in the 1950s, to larger and larger integrated circuits, to the point today where we have computer chips with literally billions of transistors on them that provide almost instantaneous electronic production. That leads to other kinds of developments. For example, new software that can take advantage of the very fast chips, which leads to even faster chips and so forth. Right. The other thing is, is that technology isn't a black box. The reason why we get technological progress is because there's profit to be made in doing it. In fact, in the standard model of an economy, uh, going back, let's say, to even you know, Milton Friedman's model, firms are competing with each other and they're driving down their prices to the cost of production. And the only way you escape that to make profit is to innovate and do a technological change which lowers your cost below everybody else's cost, at least temporarily. And the reason why we have patents and licenses is to give you a little time to take advantage of that gain. Well, that profit motive, the desire uh, to continue to make a profit, drives people to continually make technological innovation in order to stay ahead of the competition. Right? And then, as I said, technology can also give you increasing returns to scale. That, to most of you, may seem like, eh, economists talking to themselves, but this is a fundamental different way to think about technology. From the point of view of the rest of this discussion, though, this evening, it's critical because it begins to tell you why certain cities do really well and why others do not. Detroit has a gargantuan <coughs> amount of physical capital. I worked in one of those factories where we had hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment, from small hammers, to three-story high uh, presses that <coughs> took powdered metal, like talcum powder, and turned them into gears. But if technological progress is what really drives, pro uh, drives economic growth, cities that are rich in technological progress may do better than cities that are rich in physical capital. <coughs> so let's think about some history. You look at the period 1870 to 1929, Great Britain led the United States in terms of per capita income. The U.S. only had a per capita income of only about three-fourths that of Great Britain. In both countries, education per worker increased about the same, and saving rates were comparable. That would suggest that at the end of that period, Great Britain should still be ahead of the U.S. by about U.S. should be behind by about three-fourths. About the same amount of investment based on savings, about the same amount of investment <coughs> based on education. But by 1929, per capita income in the United States was 30% higher than in Great Britain. Even though the savings rates were about the same, even though the education improvement was about the same. Why did the United States eclipse Great Britain? Well. According to the new growth theorists, British investors took their savings and invested a lot of that abroad. Some of it here came to the United States. But even more important than that, the United States during this time became a major technological innovator. 
with people like Henry Ford, Thomas Alva Edison, the Wright brothers. Plus, Americans tend to do it <coughs> at home. It's very interesting. The very first major project I did as a graduate student at uh, the University of Michigan in the late 1960s was to be a research assistant to a professor, Jeff Shepard, who was writing a chapter for a book that came out from the Brookings Institution called Britain's Economic Prospects. The year is 1966. Britain is in a funk. Their economy is growing much slower than the rest of Europe, than Europe, and much, much slower than the United States, about one third our rate. And the question was why? And so there were chapters in this Brookings volume that dealt with capital <coughs> investment, that dealt with um, investment in new technologies, that dealt with uh, a whole bunch of, of issues like that. The chapter that I was asked to work on was the chapter on higher education. And I knew very little about Britain. I wouldn't, be to, I wouldn't take my first trip to Britain until three years later. But as I looked through all this literature, I kept finding something very interesting about Britain versus the United States. Britain was famous for its universities like, of course, Oxford and Cambridge and some of its red brick universities. But what was the United States fam famous for? Certainly it had its Harvards and its Yales. But what it had at many of its universities around this country were colleges of engineering. Colleges of engineering. Northeastern had one of them. MIT, of course, was very famous for it. Cal Polytech, another Michigan, Michigan State. And then I realized that in Britain, the first college of engineering was founded, and Britain is an older country than ours, was founded in 1958. What about Imperial, what? What about Imperial College? Well, Imperial College actually didn't have a college of engineering. They did a lot of physics, they did a lot of that. But what occurred was that you had schools of technology, but they were really quite second rate. Britain felt that their big investments should be in big science, whereas what we were doing is investing in real engineering technology. And the first colleges of of engineering called Colleges of, for Advanced Technologies, the so-called CAT School, C-A-T, founded in 1958, were not even allowed to offer a college degree. They offered diplomas, not college degrees. So here in the United States, we're getting our hands dirty. We are taking the great science, some of it developed in Britain, and translating it into <coughs> technological progress here. And as a result, beginning in the 1920s, we really do eclipse Britain quite a bit. Germany is doing the same. They're putting a lot of money into technology. As it will be true, so does Japan. Not Britain. Okay. The second thing that begins to happen, of course, is the change in transportation and communication. <coughs> it's very interesting. Um, if you go back and you look at imports as a share of GDP. Remember Y equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M? Gross domestic product is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports. Uh, the import share of GDP is simply M over Y. Right? In 1929, in the summer of 1929, before the stock market crash, Imports as a share of GDP were 5.7%. That is, for every $100 of GDP, 5.7% was made up of imports. What is fascinating is that percentage actually declines during the Depression. It declines during World War II. We're not importing much across the sub-infested Atlantic and Pacific. And indeed, it is not until 1969 that we get back to imports as a share of GDP equal to 5.7%. So 40 years go by, and the kind of import dependency of the United States is no greater in 1969 than 1929. 
1929, the most common way to communicate with your family in California, if you lived in Boston, was by telegraph. Right? The most common way to get across the country was by steam locomotive. By 1969, we're traveling by the jumbo jet. The Boeing 747 is introduced that year. The first one takes commercial <coughs> flight. We're still on those 747s today, 40 years later. And we are using the first satellite link communication channels in 1969. But despite that dramatic improvement in technology, <coughs> Imports as a share of GDP are no greater in 1969 than 1929. Following 1969, however, import share just increases dramatically. It's 11% by 1979. It's 15% by 1989. And today, it's closing in on 20%. Jumbo jets, super tankers, the container ship greatly reduce the cost of transportation, making it possible to move huge numbers of, of parts, real physical parts, or final products, either near the speed of sound on a jumbo jet, or fairly quickly in huge container ships across the country. When we were in uh, Shanghai, China, two years ago, uh, we were the guests of Costco, which is not the Costco you think of, but the China Overseas Shipping Company. And it turns out that container ship are so efficient now that the cost of a men's shirt, let's say size 16 and a half, 33, in blue with button down collar, to ship from China, from the port of Shanghai, to the port of Portland, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington, is about 13 cents. About 13